Welcome everyone to Authors at Drucker. I'm Dave Specht, Director of the Global Family Business Institute here at the Drucker School of Management. At the Drucker School, we aspire to become the global meeting place for the world's most influential business for owning families. The conversation today represents progress of our achievement of that uh, objective. Authors at Drucker is an interview series where we feature top authors that write about issues impacting business owning families. Authors at Drucker is made possible from the generous sponsorship from the James E. Hughes Jr. Foundation. The foundation is dedicated to advancing the study of family governance and generational well being. We at the Drucker School feel very aligned and very grateful to Jay and his foundation. Last month on Authors at Drucker, we heard from Jamie Weiner, author of The Quest for Legitimacy. If you missed it, please visit our website so that you can listen to that recording. Before we begin, I wanted to mention uh, two other exciting initiatives um, happening at the, at the Drucker School Global Family Business Institute. Let me share my screen quickly here. One of those is our certificate program. It's a new program in advising family enterprises. And in this program, we have six modules. This can be delivered in person or virtually. And what we do is we partner with institutions to deliver this to advisors, um, CPA firms, financial, uh, financial advisory firms, private banks. So if you or your institution are interested in that, um, please feel free to shoot me an email and I can get you more information. The next one we're really excited about is the Generational Wealth Masterclass, which is coming soon. Um, in that masterclass, I partnered with Jay Hughes to tackle some of the, the most challenging non-financial issues that generational wealth creates, um, whether that is kind of redefining what wealth is, navigating financially diverse relationships, um, how to appreciate non-board in-laws, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested in, in being added to kind of the early adopter list there, please do shoot me an email and I will add you to the list. So with, without further ado, I wanna introduce our authors today. Um, today we have Russ Allen Prince. Russ is one of the leading authorities in the private wealth industry. He consults with family offices, successful entrepreneurs, and select financial services professionals. He's authored or co-authored more than 60 books on related topics. So Russ, I'm not sure how you have time to do anything else but write books, but thanks for making time for joining us today. It's a our, pleasure to be here, thank you. Our, our co-author for Russ is also joining us today, Bob Doherty. Bob served as the Dean of the Forbes School of Business and Technology and as a professor of strategy and finance. He served on uh, over two dozen corporate boards and he regularly advises private equity firms, institutional investors and family offices on mergers and acquisitions and corporate governance. Russ and Bob, thanks for, thanks for joining us to talk a little bit about your book, How to Build a High-Performing Single-Family Office. Great to be here. Thanks, Dave. Um, Russ, I wanted to jump in with you with for the first question. Um, I feel like family office has become more of a marketing term, maybe than a description of uh, of services. So, you know, at the beginning of the book, you you talk a little bit about virtual family offices, multifamily offices, embedded family offices, etc. Um, today, I'd like for us to focus our attention on the single family office which in the book you describe as a legal entity dedicated to optimizing the financial and related world of a successful fan of one successful family. So you talk about three characteristics of high performing family offices. I wanted to want to see if you would start with that first one, which you call the human element. Thank you, David. When you talk about family offices, the defining characteristic and the reason they either succeed or fail and this carries over to family businesses as well is family and the human element is addressing that point the idea is that this is about the family it's not about the technology at the end it's not about the different types of resources you can access that's all fits in but you have to start with the family what they want, how they work together, how they make decisions, how they think, 
how they don't make decisions, how they don't think, how they conflict. Those are the elements that really make this come together or doesn't. And if you're going to have a high performing single family office, what is absolutely essential is that there is a consensus around what it's going to do. And the family has to create that consensus. So it's not just about saying, great, we have this list of services and products, or we have these options that you can fit into. It's really about the family. And we're referring to that as the human element, the people involved, how they relate, and how they work together, how they have to work around each other. That is core to the whole process. And that is really at the center of all family offices, no matter how they're structured and put together. So one of the things I've seen, Russ, is we, we typically get it backwards. Um, oftentimes, these structures come together to minimize tax, or the structure comes together to access um, certain financial investments or vehicles. But the family seems to be an afterthought, oftentimes. So how do we flip that on its head to make sure that if, if a family is forming one of these entities, that they keep the, the first thing first? Well, going to that point, you have to keep in mind that a lot of people who are thinking of setting this up are talking to different professionals. And let's be realistic, those professionals are looking at it through their perspective, their lenses. So if I'm a lawyer, the issue becomes, how do I structure this? What jurisdiction makes sense? What are the corporate entities involved or trusts? The money manager is looking at it from the point of view of what the assets are supposed to do or not do or what I need to do with them. Okay, so that's the perspective because the industry is, I'll say, driving that process when that happens. Yeah. And that tends to not lead to what we're calling a high-performing single-family office, not even close. What really has to happen is that the family has to first identify the outcomes. What do we want to achieve by doing this? What is the purpose of having this family office in the first place? And yeah. purpose is a big word that you can sort of hook on to. What outcomes are we looking to get from doing this? Why is this then a better solution than just going our own way and doing it individually as family members? So if you start thinking about the outcomes and you think those through, and you have to think those through, it isn't like, I want to manage, I want my money to do better. That's not an outcome, right? That's along the way. What we want to do is, what am I trying to accomplish? So even in creating family offices, one of the questions we ask is, do you want a family dynasty? A family dynasty, as we're defining it, Bob and I, is five generations where the money, the buying power of the money, and the family values, and that's a big piece of this, can transfer down the generations. And a single family office can be instrumental in making that happen. Okay, that's an outcome we're looking for in the family office. Yeah. So outcomes is the way it has to work. And when you do that, and when you do it from that perspective, what's really very powerful is that the family you know, solidifies around it and stays together around it which is really essential to making this work. Well, and I think if you kind of codify the process and the purpose, you have you have something to return to when things get sideways or when family members um, want to do things that are not in alignment. It, then it kind of depersonalizes the no that you might have to deliver to a family member. To, and without that, um, I can see how negative family dynamics can can be introduced. Yeah, absolutely. You need this as a foundation. And it doesn't mean it's locked in stone, so to speak. It does evolve. Family members' sure. perspectives change. But if we don't have a agreement on the outcomes, then people start going off in different directions. And those conflicts you mentioned or disagreements Okay, I mean, in one case, they disagreed by shooting at each other. So, I mean, there can be sort of extreme disagreements. That happens. If you have this going in, people are aware, they have expectations of being set. People know what to get out of this situation. And they also know the mechanisms to change it if they need to. 
one of the things that you know I compare between a family business an operating company and a family business and a family office um, you know they need to be together by choice so in a family business standpoint they need to be owners by choice there needs to be an off ramp there needs to be an exit possibility and I find that in whether it's in a family business or in a family office if there is no choice if there is no path outward um, to be able to do their own thing then uh, again, that that can impact the dynamics because people feel like they're they're basically being held hostage there. They have to be there. So, um, Bob, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your your personal experience. Um, you have a family office of your own. I wanted to see if you would be willing to share a little bit of the background, your background um, as an executive, and then you had a liquidity event, and then you had a decision to make, and you chose to utilize a family office structure. And I wanted to just see if you would kind of take us behind the curtain. And you're you're muted, by the, by the way. So most of my family likes me. Muted. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, thanks. Thanks again for having me. And, and the last 15 minutes that you and Russ just talked about, um, there's so much to unpack there and it comes down to codified process. But yeah, just quickly on my own background, I, I grew up very modestly I to K through 12. Um, uh, my parents were K through 12 teachers. They're now in their early nineties. Um, I grew up outside of Cleveland and um, I was a gifted student. So I was very good at math. I got to go to Harvard. I went to graduate school a couple of times and um, thought I was going to have a career in rising up in the corporate ladder um, 20 some years ago, I was working at GE Capital. They asked me to go run a venture portfolio company that I like to describe as um, bleeding like a stuck pig. It was losing a couple million dollars a month. And, you know, GE said, hey, we'd like you to go run that. And I the, I've made a couple of smart decisions in my life. Um, one was to say, okay, well, I'm not going to be a GE employee while I go run that business. If I'm actually going to turn it around, I actually want to have the upside to doing that in which they let me do um the other good decision other than marrying my wife um was buying berkshire hathaway stock 30 years ago but um <laughs> and 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 uh, i wish i just would have had more money to buy more but uh, but in any event i um i was um I was able to hire some really terrific people to help me turn that business around which we ended up selling to a, a public company and that created a liquidity event um right around 2001 so 22 years ago i came into truly money that my um i would never have to work again and if my kids were wise they'd never have to work again so but over the last 20 years i've 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 seen that some increase almost 5x um and and how i've thought about managing that wealth for future generations and as russ has defined it you know i i would love to establish a dynasty but more importantly i'd like to have um generations of really good people because mm -hmm. really the only thing i'm going to leave my my kids is my name and hopefully we'll all make a, a a mark in the world by um leaving it a better place which are really easy words to say really hard to do you know, and, and, and Dave, just coming back to what you said, and I'll be happy to jump deeper into how my family office is structured and why I've structured it that way. But, you know, you and Russ started the conversation off with, you know, what, what are the issues that get in the way of family? And, you know, Russ has always zeroed in exactly on what it is, which is, there's sort of there's money and that's a very complicated subject for a lot of people there's the legal structure and there you have a lot of machiavellian activity <laughs> then the third is the family and and you know we like to call it the mlf ratio and it's remarkable to me that most family offices spend 70 percent of the time on the money 20 percent of the time on the legal and only 10 percent of the time on the family and that really, and, and Dave, you said, if you can codify process within a family office, you can flip that ratio, which is re what's really important. So that 70% is on family, you know, 20% is on the money and 10% is probably on the legal and might even be too much. Um, and so, um, but yeah, I guess the last thing I would add is, 
is around the family is really understanding the hopes and dreams, the concerns, the anxieties of all the family members. You know, is there a process to explain concepts and ideas um, that if you have somebody in the family, it's not a business person, that they understand <laughs> what an IRR is, <laughs> you know, they understand compound interest. And then ultimately, how do you build sincere and trusting relationships with family members? And how do you educate them? And um, and then, you know, the, the trick shot of trick shots is how do you pass that on to generations and build productive yeah. systems. So, yeah. So take us into um, your family office a little bit. So you, you had your exit. Um, you had desires to have a hands-on approach to your investments, probably because of your background. Not, not everyone's going to have that same uh, level of skill, but take us into a little bit about how you decided to structure and how you decided from a, like a human element, who you wanted to have inside on your team and who maybe you would lean on to, you know, as outsourced resource, you know, resources. Sure. And, and I'm sure most everybody on this podcast knows that, you know, the history of family offices, which goes all the way back to to JP Morgan and then the Rockefeller family, most single family offices grow out of an ongoing business concern so that the business is generating enough free cash flow, it's profitable, um, self sustaining, strong market position. Um, and then the question is, what do we do with this extra money? And can we apply some of our business skill and knowledge into an adjacent market or even a completely new market? Um, but the existing business stays in place. Oftentimes what happens is within the CFO, uh, the CFO is chartered with, hey, Charlie or Jane, go go invest some money for us. Um, in my instance, we didn't have that. We truly just had, you know, a lump sum of capital that came into, um, into, into our possession, which that alone... Um, also creates really interesting dynamics as to how quickly you deploy that capital, but more importantly, how how quickly you emotionally get comfortable with that capital. I'm advising a, a couple of young guys that are, um, they have a business that they've grown really from scratch in the last six, seven years to it's probably worth 400 million today. And you would think these guys are still running their paper out. I mean, it's it's they're really trying to get comfortable with um, with the wealth that they're creating. So in my instance, you know, I, um, I, Dave, as you said, I, I do have a background in business. I have a background in finance, um, and so I, I actively um, sought ways to build some infrastructure, and that started with hiring a dedicated internal controller, um, and then a couple of analysts, and then we outsource all of our legal and tax and and accounting work. Um, um, okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, I want to go back a little bit in the conversation, Bob, where you were talking about kind of this allocation and, and you talked about an allocation of time to legal and investment and then family. But I want to visit, and maybe this one's for, for you too, Russ, just about the allocation of resources, because oftentimes, even in family offices, um, there's not a dedicated budget for investing in the human, in the human development of beneficiaries and heirs um i don't know russ do you want to speak to that actually you've probably seen a lot more than both bob and i in terms of just sheer volume you're, you're muted by the way um thank you i'll start and then bob can join in because he has a lot of experience as well most of the family offices are set up manage money that's usually the driving factor. It's not always the case. I work with one family office who has a negative net worth and they own three blocks of Manhattan real estate. So nevertheless, most of it's about managing money. The family is sort of dragged along into it in some respects. They're there, everybody has a point of view and we're trying to sort of sort it out. And some of it's more autocratic, some of it's more collaborative, there's not a lot of resources put in. Now, the complication is when there are resources put in, many of them are actually not that effective. 
So they might have things like family meetings. Now, a family meeting, when the family gets together and the patriarch tells everybody what they're going to do, is not what we're calling a family meeting anymore. Yeah. Right? So it's a matter of how you do this. Also, everybody talks about empowering the next generation when they get to this. Right? Empowering is a great term, and it sounds really good. And if you ask people what that means, you get a lot of different answers. Right? Empower. Yes, I'm teaching my kids to think like I think. Okay? That might not be empowering to some of them. So it isn't being done, and it's being done in some respects as an afterthought. Now, the interesting thing is that most of this is outsourced. There are a lot of groups, a lot of specialties, a lot of very talented people that are brought in to help deal with this issue. Right? Um, one of the most important things you can teach the children, one of the most absolutely important things is how to work in this industry, how to actually deal with the other professionals, because they have no clue. It's been handled by other people, how to actually work with them, what questions to ask of professionals. The idea of taking this blindly, which is what happens in a lot of these families, ends up making that next generation much less efficient than the first generation, right? They might not have the knowledge or sophistication from experience that the first generation, did. as Bob was pointing out, they had a business. They were successful in the business. They made the business work. Maybe they sold the business. Then the kids come along, and I can put this in perspective. I grew up in Brooklyn. When I was growing up, I learned how to hotwire a car climb over barbed wire, and run fast from the police. You sort of learn a certain, you know, in Brooklyn, if you're not yelling at each other, meant you didn't care. My son grew up in Redding, Connecticut. He can go and go, tree, deer, fox. There's a different kind of um, mentality. So it takes a concerted effort to say, okay, Let's talk about who we can trust and who we don't. Let's talk about at what level we can trust. Let's talk about how to handle this. That's one aspect of empowerment. It is essential if you want the family office to keep going, just like a business. You have to think of it as a family business. If you want that family business to keep going, the inheritors have to have a certain degree of sophistication, have to be taught how to work in this environment, and it's not being done yet. Yeah. Bob, what would you add to that? Well, I'm not going to, if people haven't seen the final episode of Succession, I won't spoil anything, but there's, there's a great line from the patriarch who says to, you know, his three children, he said, I love you, but you're not serious people. And it's really around um, who is going to succeed him ultimately. And you know, I think Russ has really hit it, which is, you know, running a business and running a family are two related things, but unique and different. Running a family office done right is more akin, in my view, at least in my experience, to running a successful business. But the, but the difference really lies in what values you espouse and what culture you're trying to create. Every great company has a culture, right? There's an Amazon culture. There's an, you know, a, a um, Apple culture. My daughter is now working at Microsoft and, and, and values are just simply behaviors. And, you know, in social psychology of value is a, is it denotes the degree of importance of one action versus another action. And within a family office, especially as you go from one generation to the next generation, is, is teaching your, um, your heirs and just other members of the family right now, what is most important to us? And in some instances, perhaps what's most important is just philanthropy. It, it may not actually to be to pass this wealth on to future generations. Um, it may be to how do we make the biggest impact now? And, um, but it's in, in values is again, it, oftentimes a squishy word, like where like Russ said, empowerment is a squishy word. Um, you know, but where empowerment really works, at, at least in my experience, 
is there's a very clearly defined process around these are the inputs and the outputs and I am empowered to do this or that um, and I will do that within the value system of what we're trying to accomplish so yeah and I think often returning to the question for what purpose is probably a good thing to do whether it's uh, deciding what activities to do, what to invest in, what conversations we want to have with our rising generation, who we want to involve in the family office, for what purpose. And it, again, unless we do the hard work at, at the outset and then revisit, what is the purpose of this structure? Who are we serving? Because we'll quickly forget and be serving assets rather than serving people and and we'll probably miss the mark of the true opportunity of a single family office. Um, I wanted to, Bob, I wanted in the book, you talk about um, stress testing a family office and in this, you know, stress testing the structures and, and also the investment portion. Would you kind of pull us into that and, and tell us a little bit about what you're talking about there with the stress test? Sure, and, and it gets to system and process and decision making. And um, any well engineered um, product, process, experience um, has regular and systematic ways to, to do stress tests. And that's really trying to, um, first and foremost, um, avoid big disasters <laughs> and, and what is going to um, cause undue harm to either the family unit to the legal structure and then from a financial standpoint um you know we certainly in our our public portfolio um regularly stress test our our public positions against different events in history um which has been very helpful um you know i i think how how you stay on track and follow um what the best possible outcomes boils down to a discipline of what are you doing on a weekly basis, a monthly basis. Our cadence is more on a quarterly basis around stress testing. Um, and it's not just the financial aspect, but it's checking in with each of our family members. And, um, and I've seen this in other family offices where they are, are truly um, making sure that not only have you gotten your capital distribution or you've you know <laughs> um, made your capital call, but that you're um, that you're in sync with um, how your life is is actually connected to um, to the family office. Fantastic, Russ. Anything to add to that in terms of stress testing or thinking uh, around that? More and more and more of the families are stress testing as Bob well, pointing out the investment component because mm -hmm. let's be honest you know years ago it things were going really well for everybody almost it was sort of easy uh, it has gotten harder in the last couple of years so people are finding out that you know uh, they need to really look at some of this that he was addressing stress testing is being applied everywhere now right? many people have okay, wills, estate plans, and all the rest. And a lot of those don't actually do what they want them to do. And a lot of them get dated in ways people aren't aware of, and the tax code changes. So every aspect of this family office, one of the responsibilities is to make sure everything is up to date and online with the outcomes we want. Okay? Yeah. And the way you do that is stress testing. You just keep looking at these things looking at them under different scenarios and saying, okay, how do we adjust? Well, and when you think about, again, comparing a, like a family controlled business to a family office, I really feel like there is a, there's a lot of challenge with regards to contingency plans for management specifically, because you end up having a small group that has a ton of information, a lot of knowledge, a lot of back history with the families. And, you know, if, if that person were to not show up on Monday, you know, family offices are oftentimes in way more concentrated positions in terms of 
the people element of understanding the assets and understanding the ins and outs of the family relationships and how to navigate. So I don't know if either of you want to speak to that because I, I feel like that has not been talked about enough, just that that concentration of knowledge and the concentration of of decision making in maybe just a couple of people. When we talk to families in these family offices, the idea of a contingency plan is sort of an essential element. What happens if somebody isn't there, as you're pointing out, and for whatever reason? Yeah, retirement or whatever. Retirement decided that they won the lottery, decided that, you know, I hate the family today. There's lots of reasons, and they're all coming up. Right? What does the family do? And who actually is going to do it? So it's yeah. two parts. It's not only what's going to happen, but who is now going to actually do something? Now, when you take this into account, you have to have contingency plans. Every family in the form of an estate plan has a contingency plan, right? That's what we want. And it's not just saying, okay, here's how the assets move. But here's what we actually want to accomplish, which is why we set this up in the first place. How are we going to continue in that direction? Most families don't do this. A lot of the newer family offices are done by people who are younger. I mean, younger than Bob and me, that is. Not young, not like you, David. There's a gap in between us. That's where they are. And I remember talking to one of them and said, I'm too busy to die. And I said, if that's the solution, I can get real busy for the rest of forever. So again, it's the realization that you need something because it, everything just doesn't going to work the way you think it does. Life yeah. is messy. It's going to continue to get messy. And the contingency plans, very importantly, have to be updated consistently. Yeah. And families who are actually putting them in are not even updating them. In one family situation, I was dealing with the contingency plan would be the the son would take over these key components of the business of the, from the father and run the family office looks great on paper was absolutely wonderful there was a problem when the kid ended up in rehab yeah right so okay that contingency plan is not going to work anymore so yeah. we now have to revise it and the father's solution was it'll all be better when he gets out of rehab was okay might work but this is the third time in rehab. I'm betting it's not going to. Yeah. So yeah, we need contingency plans and stress testing is the step that takes you to contingency plan. Well, and and a long time ago, I wrote an article on theft in the family business. And, you know, and I think about the controls or the lack of controls in family offices. And I think it's a huge issue. I mean, I, I think as families lean on large financial institutions. I think the assumption is there are far greater controls um, in place. When you move into the single family office realm and you have a very small group of people that have a lot of access and a lot of control, um, Bob or Russ, what are you seeing families do to make sure there are proper controls? Because we're talking about huge risks here. Um, with few people involved. Yeah. Um, and it boils down ultimately to trust and having a sequence of decisions <laughs> um, with oftentimes outside advisors um, that um, that it's, you, you're always looking for a banker, a trust lawyer, somebody who brings a lot of probity and wisdom and, and, to the table and ideally you have those people on staff inside your family office but most family offices the teams are relatively small yeah um and that's just difficult and to russ's point you know where the father's plan was to hand things over or give some decisions and unfortunately the, the young person or younger person is impaired or and then worst case you see somebody stealing from the family i mean that's quite remarkable um the remarkable the, but but it happens regularly bob i've not experienced that that's remarkable i will actually look up your article and read it um that's really interesting 
I'll go with one of them. I was told that the daughter-in-law was not stealing from the family, all right? Because that would look really bad in the press. So the daughter-in-law instead was getting a loan from the family. And when they caught her, I mean, the police caught her um, because of some miscommunication, she repaid back the loan. So there was no stealing, going to Bob's point. It's very rare. Uh, in the sense of nobody wants to admit this is happening. Yeah. Okay? It's not that it doesn't. And, and stealing doesn't have to be huge. It's a relative term. When you talk yeah. to billionaire families and the person walks away with $20 million, which is technically stealing and was not given, and they just walked away with it. In the scheme of things, the family is not going to, it's going to make that wash over in some cases. Going from Bob's point, yeah, you have to have the values built in. It's trust, because at the end of the day, it's all going to be on trust. You can have all the systems and all the sophisticated checks and balances. And it's a small group of people. If you don't have the trust, if you're not cohesive about it, if you're not, you know, it's not collaborative and there is real antagonism and you're not dealing with all that, you're going to have dysfunctional actions that's going to ruin the situation. And there's nothing that you can, I mean, a really clever person can break through the systems. Sure. It's yeah. just a given. So you have to, you have to look now, let's also go to Ronald Reagan's famous phrase, trust, but verify. Sure. Yeah. Or even though I trust you, I still want my systems. Yeah, you got to have the systems still. Absolutely. Um, I want to pause here and just look to our audience and say, you know, I would love to have your questions show up. I want this to uh, be helpful and, and serving you. So please put your comments um, in the chat and we'll get to those in just a second. I will ask one more question and then we'll turn to the audience and see if there are some questions from, from them. Um, one of the challenges I see with family offices, especially as we get out into second, third, fourth generation is um, coming up with a strategy that serves those generations that have very different needs. So, you know, the way that my 21 year old son would choose to invest is probably different than the way that my 71 year old mother would choose to invest. And so as you think about family office and investment policies and things like that, it can become very complex. Um, Bob, I wanted to lean on you for a second here to just tackle this. As you think about the, the varied needs, I mean, people have different cash flow needs, they have different risk temperaments. So as you think about developing policies to form and frame how you manage those assets, what you invest in and what you don't invest in, um, how would you think about that and what, what would you what would you share? Yeah, we have a really simple and it's something I I adopted for myself, which is sort of this three-pronged approach, which is I want to invest in things that I understand and I like and I know. That's sort of step one. And that, you know, echoes Peter. Lynch, you know, wrote a book many years ago, 40 years ago, called One Up on Wall Street. And he was a very early investor in Dunkin' Donuts, which was started there in the New England area. And he stopped by and they had this great coffee and this great donut. And he said, I understand the donut business. That seems pretty simple and straightforward. And, and he made a fortune over it. So step one is um, investing things we we understand, know, and we like. Nobody wants to own a business or invest in things that they don't necessarily care for. Second thing is um, ideally to invest in the number one or two in the industry. And I really picked this up from Jack Welch. And, and it's interesting, and here's a nod to Peter Drucker. When Jack Welch was 44 years old and was named the CEO of General Electric, which at the time had 340,000 employees, the very first thing he did was to get on an airplane to Claremont, California and spend a week with Peter Drucker. And um, it really informed a great many things about what he did as CEO of, of General Electric. One of which was, if, if you're not the market leader or at the very top, 
then you either need to um, fix or sell or close that business, which is interesting. So that's number two on the investing side. Number three, and this harkens to, to my love of Warren Buffett, I've been to the shareholders meeting for many, many years now at this point, is to buy something at a, at a fair price. Ideally, actually, it's something that's really inexpensive um, compared to its intrinsic value. So invest in what we know, like, and understand, buy the number one or two in the sector. And then number three is get it when it's on sale. Um, you know, as it relates to family office and generations, um, what I just described is relatively easy to teach even to the non-business or finance person. Um, but, you know, the the animal spirits of 20-somethings and 30-somethings are really different <laughs> the older you get, right? And, you know, um, that's that's what's difficult in terms of teaching that discipline and, and understanding that if you don't take care of the money and are thoughtful about it and let it compound, that it has a tendency to, you know, um, your, your your appetites might outgrow your cash flows, and then you're in a whole whole host of other issues. Yeah. Well, the the other thing specifically to that point is is around cash flows. You know, what kind? And Russ, I'll go to you on this one. What kind of expectations are typically laid out for distribution policies? I mean, so that family members can have some sort of expectation for, is this gonna create cash flow, or are these simply long-term plays that we're hoping to you know, drive equity gains? What have, what have you seen there? Everything. Everything. The, point <laughs> being, the, the point being is that the different families have different expectations, different agendas, different needs and wants. Uh, you know, if the amount of money involved makes a major difference. So when you're talking to billionaire families, the fact it throws off to an excess cash is it can be enormous numbers. When you're talking to families with 100 or 200 million and they're investing in longer term thinking multi-generation, well, they need that money to compound and they're not going to distribute it the same way. Yeah. The other issue, which is more interesting than that, is what the parents, for example, expect of the kids, right? The idea of trust babies, look, I got into this business, I was getting my PhD in sociology at Stony Brook on Long Island. I went out to the Hamptons, the charity work, met a lot of trust babies. Now, this is before they became popular. And I noticed they had more fun than I was having. Right? The problem is they had too much fun, uh, where I unfortunately had to go back and have like a career at the end of this. You know, if they're in a position where they don't have to do anything, a lot of families don't want that. They, they want them to be able to benefit and do things and maybe do things constructively, but not do nothing. Yeah. So it really changes by each family. And what's important is to understand what that means in each family. So when Bob talks about investing, you know, he's looking at this and he would adjust this to what the family is trying to accomplish. So if they need more cash flow, it's a different portfolio than if they are saying, we don't have to do this and put, can lock this up for five, 10 generations or whatever it may be. So it really adapts to that family agenda. Fantastic. Okay. We have some questions coming in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, I wanted to see if we could turn to you first. Mary Mullins, if you would come on and go ahead and ask your question, we'd love to hear your voice. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I was just wondering if Bob and Russ could both speak to us about how you involve family members in discussions about what outcomes the family wants to achieve. Um, um, Russ, you mentioned that that was absolutely the first and foremost critical thing. And, and particularly, how have you seen this done well with um, minors or young adults in the family, as well as the wealth generating um, uh, adult parent? I'll go first, Bob, then you can join right in. And number the first thing we try to do, and this is dependent on the parents. So I can't just do this. It's not like it's not my call anytime I'm talking to a family. It's what the family says. We like to get the option to get the perspectives of the family members. So we want to actually call, you know, have Zoom calls, because I do everything on Zoom, with all the different people involved. Because 
when we find out that when the parents tell us, no, our kids get along great. Yeah, they get along great when they're in the room with you. They get along less great when they're by themselves. So you're getting a perspective from each of the family members. Then the idea is to diplomatically, and that's an essential word here, bring up these points in the bigger family picture. Because yeah, when look at even before this call, someone was telling me, well, why can't I just give it all away? All right. That sounds great when you're 21. It might not sound great later on, but why can't I give it all away while my parents are supporting me 100%, by the way? All right. So we want to get everybody's perspective. And then the idea is to say, okay, who is in charge? What are the key issues? And how do we bring this together? Now, when you talk about minors and so forth, now you're getting really, it gets very difficult and very hard to do it all because I'll put it this way. When my son was in uh, the end of high school and college, I was an idiot. I mean, I could, you couldn't be, I couldn't be stupider. I got a lot smarter when he had to go to work. Somehow there was a transition between when he was in college and knew everything in the world. And then the world sort of didn't respond the way he thought it would. So you're talking about your perspective on your his perspective on you are an idiot. Not, yes, not yes. An he, he, idiot. he would explain to me how you just don't understand that it's different now. Yeah, I, it, it's completely different. And then later on, he said, you know, you weren't actually all wrong. I said, thank you. And we went on. The point is that you have to just get as open a dialogue as possible. That's what it just comes down to. And it's sometimes easier for the kids, as I call them kids. Now, some of these kids are in, in their 50s, by the way. It's sometimes easier for the kids to express it outside of that family meeting. And you just have to get everybody's perspective and you have to be able to share it with the people. And then they have to make the decision. And that's the important thing. I will make no decisions. That's not my job ever. My job is to just make sure that all the points are brought out and then the family can decide what to do. Mary, and by that's... the way, they do a lot of things that I personally would never do, but that's not my life. Mary, one thing I would add to that just quickly, and we'll get to another question is, you know, you know, it's important that we realize that if we don't involve the rising generation in some of these conversations, they will feel like something is being done to them rather than something that's being done for them. And that's a conversation I'm typically having with the senior generation that's putting structures in place. Unless you're asking for their voice along the way and figuring out how they want to learn, how they want to be involved, they can resent the structure rather than the structure be a blessing to their life. So yeah, I mean, it's a really tough question, Mary, but I, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, let's see if we can get to another question here. Miguel, if you are willing to come online, uh, would you ask your question? And if you're not available. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my camera for some reason. Um, Go ahead, Miguel. Uh, wondering a question for Bob. Uh, when, when you received this lump sum that you were talking about 22 years ago, how did you kind of decide to go the family office route versus just investing, you know, some of that capital with, um, you know, some financial advisor at Merrill Lynch or some some other, you know, Fidelity or whatever? It, was there like a process there, or just you had previous experience with family offices? You've been exposed to that before, or what? You could just yeah, walk us. yeah, sure. Um... You know, candidly, I did put my money initially with outside advisors and still have um, some capital at some uh, brokerage firms. Um, and what, when and I get pitched a lot of different opportunities um, to put money to work, um, and it's always usually around, you know, I already shared my, my three things that I like to focus on in terms of just the sort of the quick criteria that I assess things with, but 
The second is, and this really speaks to the outside advisor, is is there an alignment of interest with what they're trying to accomplish with what I'm trying to accomplish? And everybody is self-interested, right? I mean, there's um, there you, you wouldn't spend your time if you didn't have self-interest somewhere at heart. <laughs> and so, um, and, and the thing about that oftentimes, unfortunately happens on Wall Street, is it it's so brazen <laughs> around, well, it's a two and 20 structure, you're going to pay me the 2% quarterly in advance. And, you, you know, you hear everything about what's in it for them first, before you ultimately really understand what are they even talking to me for other than that I have money, <laughs> which is fine. Um, they, that's ultimately how the relationship um, will transact. But what we're really looking for are long-term partners that really are trying to first understand what are we trying to accomplish? Um, and then um, and then do we have an alignment of interests and are, are our incentives aligned? And, and I, I've discovered over time that, um, and I think this comes just with age, is um, that it's a lot easier to actually align incentives um, if there's a thoughtful series of questions and conversations um, around that. And, and I know Russ does a lot of work with, with advisors specifically on this topic, but that's, that's how we decide. In terms of just my own history, um, you know, I, I worked in finance, I worked in business, I had run a business. Um, and so I kidded myself to say, yeah, I should be able to set this family thing office up without any problem. And for the most part, it's been seamless. There's absolutely been challenges, but um, it, it's worked out okay. Thank you, uh, Miguel, for the question. Um, I wanna get to Steve, we have about five minutes left. Um, Steve, do you wanna come on and ask your question? Sure. Um, so I just typed it in here. Do you have examples of families that managed to change the money legal family ratio? You talked about the 70, 20, 10. And, and how long does it take to get a family to transition from that more standard what everybody does to a percentage where the family part of it is a lot higher like i i don't imagine you walk in and say hey we're going to flip this around and in like two meetings you're there i imagine this is more like how many years and then the other part is what is the deciding factor that gets that uh kicked into the right direction yeah, I'll I'll start and then Russ, you know, jump in here. Um, and and I, uh, you know, Steve, you've you've hit on the time element, which is exactly right. It takes uh, it takes years, you know, to actually do that. And then it's what's the catalyst to make that change? And oftentimes there might be a, a crisis within sort of the family or the F ratio that kind of says, hey, let's actually figure this out. And, um, and, and what we try to focus on, and my, and my kids are in their early to mid 20s, and I really appreciate the question earlier, which is how do you teach younger people how to start to appreciate those things? And, um, you know, just one simple thing I suggest to other people that are setting up family offices that are coming into wealth, which is, we preach over and over that the only true wealth in the entire world is gratitude. If you are truly grateful that you have $2 in your pocket, truly grateful, you're the richest person on the planet. doesn't matter because you got, you know, and so every Sunday we would have, I still do when the kids are home, a gratitude dinner where you, you, we spend a lot of time going around. What am I grateful for? I know it sounds, I don't know how that sounds, maybe like the Waltons or something, but um, for those of you old enough to remember the Waltons, great show. Um, but, uh, that, and, and that starts a series of questions and conversations. Russ, of course, hits on it, you know, teenagers, <laughs> you'll hear that I'm grateful I don't have homework tonight. Right. And that's, it's, it is what it is, but that's how I'd answer. Russ, do you have examples of how long? I talk to wealthy family, extremely wealthy families every week, multiple ones. No one talks to me because life is good. They don't say, you know, I haven't spoken to Russ yet. We probably, if we give him a bunch of money, he'll get, get on a Zoom call with us. It doesn't happen that way. So going back to what Bob hit on, it's usually some sort of crisis of some kind that triggers it. Something has to go wrong 
in the family, when everything is going well and the family is not posing a problem and the mind, it's not going to shift. Something has to upset the family. It has to be somehow something to set people off in some way or another that they say, we have to fix something. And that's when it goes. And then going back to Bob's point, even when that happens, just because people think that's the right direction, it's a, still a time intense process to get people to say, yeah, but why doesn't he just do it my way? I, I hear that a lot. Well, that's because you didn't do it the way you were told to do it. So that's how it seems to work that way from my experience. Steve, thanks. Thanks for that question. Thank um, you. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We're about one minute, uh, one minute till. Um, Russ, Bob, thank you so much for, for being willing to share. Um, if you haven't picked up a copy of their book, How to Build a High-Performing Single-Family Office, um, if you want to go deeper into these topics, I would suggest you pick it up. Um, just a quick housekeeping item. Next month on Authors at Drucker, I will be hosting Whitney Johnson. Um, and her book is called Disrupt Yourself. Uh, this is a fantastic book about looking at what you're doing now and maybe challenging some of your own assumptions so that you can become, uh, whether it's professionally or personally, uh, you know, who you really want to become. So please do join us there. Um, again, thank you so much for investing an hour with us today. Bob and Russ, can't thank you enough. Appreciate it. And uh, please do uh, share if you're enjoying Authors at Drucker. Please bring a friend next month. Um, these are free. And uh, we love to share, share these messages to help families and their advisors. So everyone have a great day and uh, see you next month. Thanks, Dave.